Yeah, nano oil is great stuff. I'm surprised more people don't know about it. But Labelle is so pro, uh, prevalent that, you know, I used to use Labelle, probably three or four of their products. But uh, my goodness, the difference with nano oil is astonishing, especially when you can see it. Uh, it's, it's something else. Mm -hmm. Now they've got a nano grease. Did you hear about that? Mm -mm. Well, they had three, they had two oils and a heavy oil uh, weights. Right. Now they came up with what they call nano grease. I haven't tried it. I, I'm not particularly sure I want to try it because the heavy oil does really great in the gearbox. And as near as I can tell, it doesn't gel up or do anything weird. So I, I've been using that in gearboxes. And it's great because a lot of the gearboxes I take apart and clean or, you know, have been around 20, 30 years because I love to get old models and redo them and fix them up. That sounds like an article. <laughs> Do a yeah. review of nano oil. Oh, yeah. Yeah, great, great, great product. I'm all, all for it. There's another product that if you're into machining, it's called Beolube, B-E-O-L-U-B-E. -E. And Beolube is a, a cutting oil and cutting grease. And it, it was in, uh, used by Boeing, hence the Bio. Ah. And you can get it off of um, Amazon and a couple other places too. And for cutting, cutting oil, oh my gosh, great stuff. Just absolutely great stuff. Makes it sorry if you're machining it makes a big difference so are we talking machining metal or plastic or both actually uh, i've used it on both successfully but the primary use is on metal uh and it it uh, keeps the edges sharp on your tools keeps the uh, cut sharp chris great stuff you know i have no idea where they came up with all this stuff but i heard about it from a uh a retired machinist at Boeing who posted something on some, some blog or post somewhere years and years ago and got a hold of some. And my God, does it work well? <laughs> uh, those are two that I would absolutely recommend above anything else. There's a lot of many different cutting oils that are out there. And a lot of them are recommended for a particular application like, um, uh, you know, milling aluminum, they use a slightly different oil than, than uh, cut milling steel. Um, you can even mill titanium if you have the right tools, but that, that requires not just lubrication, it requires cooling. Titanium is tough stuff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't think anybody you ever use it in modeling, but. It has the wrong properties. It's tough, but it's too light. We want weight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it could be. But it's it's amazing to come across a new product or a new um, material, uh, like you know some of the magnets that that stimulated uh, this clinic I, that I'd never seen before, didn't know anything about, and all of a sudden there's an idea. Hey, I I wonder if I could use it here wonder if I could use it there. And it's, you know, the uh, surface mount LEDs when they came out, what, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, I kept looking at it and said, I'm never going to use any surface mount device anywhere. And, uh, you know, you, you get to realize that they have their place and you can use them and you can learn how to use them. And that's, it's, it's like learning a new tool. And I, that's the way I look at a lot of this stuff. A lot of my clinics are about, here's a new tool to use, you know, go out and build great models. I would have never thought of using uh, surface mounts, but as long as they come with wires attached, I'm good. <laughs> but there's a, there's a, somebody on uh, in China, that has uh, uh, 0201, uh, sunny white and, and uh, bright white, the, the bluish tint LEDs that are already mounted to, uh, I think the 36 gauge magnet wire. I bought some, they work great. And they're the, the tiniest things I've ever seen. 
And I don't even want to deal with trying to uh, buy a batch of them and, and solder to them. But they are incredibly tiny. Yeah. Nick Santos, the guy behind uh, Nick Trains, the decoder buddy. Yeah. Um, he solders up his own SMD LEDs. Yeah. Dinky They're tiny ones. And I don't know how he does it. Yeah, the, the first article that I wrote for MRH was about using LEDs, including how to solder to uh, SMD LEDs yeah. called Points of Light. That's a while ago. <laughs> it, it can be done. It, 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 if you follow the procedure and use a, a sticky tape, which I use blue painter's tape, sticky side up to hold them, it's great. I mean, you can do it. The, the trick to working with incredibly small uh, pieces of anything is only one thing moves. That's what I tell people. So you, you put everything in place. And when you solder, the, the only thing that moves is the soldering iron. Everything else has got to be already ready for the heat from the tip of the iron. But you can do it. Um, it, it, it slows people down. I think that's why it drives a lot of people crazy, but it can be done. I'm just not sure I'm steady enough of hand. Yeah. That's why only one thing needs to move. Yeah. The other hand is steady everything. Well, yeah. Pain pass actually, but yeah, we're, uh, I've shifted gears on the, the ground base cover that I'm going to use. I was going to use ground up dirt and decided that was way too much work. Uh, and more to the point is that last weekend, uh, Marty McGurk on the uh, hindsight 2020 uh, virtual meet uh, kind of empowered me to rethink that as he was going over fall scenery, I'm doing spring scenery, but uh, Marty is using uh, sanded grout. I've heard of that stuff. So off to Lowe's I went and got three different colors, uh, used a couple of them, and I'll start mixing them. Uh, it definitely works well. Uh, and what that means is no grinding or, yeah, mashing and grinding of dirt and uh, other straining of it and all of the rest of that that goes with using real dirt. Are you sifting that, Bill? The, uh, the sanded grout, I don't really have to sift it. It's already so fine that uh, I can just sort of uh, use my hand uh, with a, uh, a, a, a butter tub, and, and it just sort of lightly sprinkles. I mean, if I, I could sift, I do have sifters, and I could use them if I needed it, but I didn't need it. <laughs> That's how really, are you? That's how do you fix good. it in place? Uh, paint it with uh, white glue. Paint the surface. Okay, that'll keep it from turning into a paste and then cement, I guess. Yeah. So I have yet to experiment with subsequent co coats on top of it, including things that wet it heavily. You know, because most scenery techniques actually use a lot of wetting. Oh so. yeah. Akin to today's clinic, have you tried sticking a magnet into a pile? and see if there's any uh, magnetic material in it? I, yeah, I had actually thought about that with the real dirt routine. I, 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 I haven't actually thought about that. I may just go do that right now, grab a magnet and see what it does with the sanded grout, but I don't yeah. expect any problem there. I wouldn't expect it either, but you know, I've been wrong about stuff yeah. like that. Before. Right, you always have to check. Yep, I agree. <laughs> good, good pointer, Jeff. And I've done that. <laughs> yeah. It is, it is very fine, uh, so which makes it even worse. You know, if it's magnetic, that'll be wreak real havoc with motors so, <laughs> and when gears. You, when you feel it after you've laid it down, is it very coarse? No, it's actually pretty fine. Wow. Which makes for good dirt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in HO scale. How does it take paint? Don't know. <laughs> I would expect pretty well, actually. I, I've only just begun this experiment, so 
mean, as I said, it was last weekend, so it's this week that I pick some up and, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, tried to experiment with it. So, Do you actually know what the composition is of the material? Well, uh, other than obviously there's sand in there, which would uh, uh, imply silicon carbide. But uh, beyond that, uh, I, I mean, it's a mortar. Oh, so. really? It's kraut. Well, Grout. Oh, it is grout. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. You said sanded. It's grout. intended for uh, doing uh, tile work. Oh, okay. Okay. Great. I've used yeah, it I a little bit. That. I've used it some. It's fine. I used some leftover stuff I had. Yeah. It, it, the thing that uh, I like here is that A, I don't have to do any prep work to it, and B, uh, I can get, as long as the supply chain works, which are really the transportation net, because this stuff is, I'm pretty sure, produced in the United States or maybe in Mexico, uh, but on this continent, <laughs> uh, means that I'll be able to get more as I need it. All right. It's 10 o'clock or 10.02. Um, so, welcome all to our October meet. Um, we're going to try and reestablish this as being a monthly thing. Uh, we will be Zoom until we're allowed to actually meet in person again. Um, and no matter whether or not we would like to meet together, um, the likelihood of finding a facility that would allow us to is pretty low. So we're not even not even looking for that at the moment. Um, so technically we begin these things with a business meeting. Um, I don't know of any business aside from uh, what I just said that this is going to be monthly. Uh, to go over, uh, Richard has indicated that he doesn't know of any business we need to discuss. Does anybody else have anything that the second division needs to know about. And please remember that you're probably on mute. So one announcement actually is uh, if anybody remembers back on uh, February of 2020 at our last live meeting, we said we were going to have a boxcar contest. Ah. We have uh, a bunch of boxcars that uh, boxcar shells. You are welcome to take that boxcar shell and make something else out of it. When we actually are able to meet again will be when that is due. And Jeff is now displaying said boxcar. So uh, he's got them. I've got some. Uh, holler at us if you want to come over and pick up one or two and uh, make a diorama or, you know, detailed out. It will be a contest. It will be, there will be a prize for whoever does the best. Thank you, Richard. And on that, uh, y'all set, John? Got the script. Got my IT department here. <laughs> Let's go to Estacada. Okay. Suppose as an intro, this is John and uh, at least one other member of the Mount Hood model engineers are building a layout at the Casadero restaurant, steakhouse, grill. I'm not sure what the exact name is out in Estacada. Um, and it's partially complete, and John's going to give us an update on it. There we go. Yeah. Okay, so if you're driving into Estacada on Highway 224 at Highway 211, this is the sign you would see for the Casadero restaurant. And don't ask me what that is on the reader board because I don't know the name of the family. Uh, so anyway, this is looking out of the back of the restaurant. I think that'd be a, something good to model because that bridge is out of the 30s, I believe. And this is before everything started to turn. Now I'm just going to be uh, the Chamber of Commerce for a few minutes, so hang in there, guys. 
And this is the hotel in Estacada in the 20s. And um, this is a mural that's done by a group called Art Back. And this one is, uh, was painted in 1995 and restored in 2015. Now you're looking at this, well, well, that's a shade, but what is that? Well, it's, when I first saw this, I went, that's the weirdest looking tree. Actually, that's uh, when they were building the uh, Casadero Dam, which is now called the Faraday Dam. That's uh, how they move stuff around was by rail. And this one is uh, basically showing, let me get look at my notes here. The cycle of wood. This is only part of a of a uh, mural. There's over 20 murals in Estacada, and um, you know, people passing through probably miss this. I think it's uh, I think it's fantastic. I I have yet to probably look at all of them with uh, as much as I've looked at these two I just showed you. And last but not least, there is our Veterans Memorial. Uh, I guess we call it a garden, which the community put a lot of time and effort in. So on with the, uh, the railroad. So when you walk into the Casadero restaurant on the restaurant side, you see many pictures. And even to the left of this is many pictures. And this one right up here in the corner where you can see the cowboys and the wooden streets, that is something we're going to duplicate on this uh, diorama railroad. It will have, we're going to put wood in. And here is something, if you're thinking of uh, researching a town or whatever, this is a Sanborn fire map. And you can find these online. You can just Google the name of the town and see what pops up. And this one has helped us uh, figuring out how to place buildings um, on the on the layout slash diorama. Okay, this is how it started. It looks kind of like a mess, and it is. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we're <clears throat> excuse me, we're mocking up track with Bachman Easy Track, and uh, you can see a sign underneath and skinny legs on the bench work and uh, stuff on the wall. All this has changed dramatically and the bench work that you're looking at there I'm not much of a carpenter but I've had to uh, go in and put uh, one by four legs and diagonal bracing <clears throat> and um, well I'll show you more pictures here in just a second and here's the start of it this is a uh, <clears throat> we use two inch foam on top and uh, the reason we chose foam is because it's easy to work with and we can carve it. And here's uh, some more work in the corner. Oh yeah, well, I'm winging it on my notes here, guys. But anyway, this is how we started a lot of the construction. And we're back to old school, newspaper and tape. And here's Dan Parr, the lead artist on this. And if you look right back along the wall, that's uh, probably over a, a hundred feet of plaster cloth. <clears throat> and this is the start of the end where you would walk in the restaurant and see, see the beginning of this. And <clears throat> this is what it looks like today. And so you guys were talking about, you know, what you put on the a layout. We're using dirt from my uh, outbuilding, which has a dirt floor. And uh, what the first thing we did with the foam is I painted it with a latex from Miller Paint. It's that recycled paint that uh, Metro has. And uh, if you don't want it to stink for about five or six dollars, they'll put a scent in it. And uh, it uh, takes away the paint odor. So anyway, we put a, a coat of latex on top. We're using real dirt. And then we're using all the different scenery products. And this is, you can see I've got plexiglass here. This is to protect it from the uh, customers and a few people that walk past through the bar that, you know, may have a little too much from the bar in them. 
and and you can see that you can see that the legs have changed at the bottom there and some of the bracing we've got to do this because we pull this in and out when we're working on it and then when the customers start coming in we got to shove it back in the corner and there's kind of the backside. you can see how we've used paneling and you know different things to hold the the uh, scenery up here in the back and this is now telling you what is going on so basically look over here the bench work the fir trees which are coastman fir trees and buildings are done by the owner's parents and then it's myself dan parr and uh, another fellow jeff who um helps us occasionally with details from the Mount Hood Club are doing the detail work and planning things out. So there's Dan again, looking things over. Um, now we're using static grass and it's, it's coming out fine. There's a lot of detail there that you kind of see some dead trees and you see a lot of undergrowth and um and i don't know it's 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 kind of hard to describe in pictures but we we're getting it down so it's i think it's museum quality i mean not not that i'm bragging or anything but we could have made it toy like and yes we are using bachman's easy track all the way through this it's just a dog bone on each end and uh we've started to ballast it and when you ballast easy track you can hide it now, look at these buildings. Those are all printed on a computer. And that's what the owner's dad is uh, sent over. And uh, this is all new that we just put in this stream here and the bridge and, and uh, it's just, it's, it's coming along. That's, that's a farm scene that would be to the, uh, the south of Estacada over, over here on the, on the far left. We haven't got the town in yet. We got the buildings, but it's all once again, planning, putting in wooden streets, um, just a lot of little, little things. And then this building here in the middle, you can just barely see it. It says Casadero. That was a stop that was outside of Estacada years ago. And so this building replicates that particular stop. And they had these little farmhouses out there too. And once again, looking over the plex, we got a sawmill here that you can kind of see there. It's pretty tiny. I think it's a, one of the kits that's available. Um, and here is Bagby Hot Springs, something that's been talked about for years. And uh, this is, we're duplicating it, maybe what it would have been like in the 20s, because we don't know. It, we've had a lot of people kind of give us the insight, and we know it was pretty rustic. And then over here is, of course, the, uh, the uh, hermit's cabin, and he'll have a donkey. And, of course, we have a lot of outhouses. Gee, I wonder why. And this is, we were going to call this a logging camp, but it's more of a, a construction camp for the workers that were probably building the dam. And uh, so all those tents are just paper. Um, and then we've added all the details and the, and the underbrush and the vehicles and just a lot of stuff. These cars may or may not be on the railroad where we know uh, we still haven't worked out what cars we wanna have. And this is Philip Foster Farm. So when you're driving to Estacada coming from Portland, you go through Eagle Creek, and this is this was a stop in the late 1840s for the pioneers coming out on the Oregon Trail, on the Barlow Trail. So all this is pretty much based on pictures that they've had uh, from years past. And these little buildings in the back were actually cabins where the pioneers could stop and rest on their journey out. And you see, uh, you know, more Bachman track here. I know it's not what a lot of you guys want for your layout, but hey, we're building it in a restaurant. We're trying to make it, uh, I guess, the KISS method, just keep it simple. But anyway, this was one of the first areas that was detailed and we still got more fencing. 
probably put more animals in. I mean, it just, it, it grows every, every time we kind of look at it. So <clears throat> this is, um, see the little sign there above, below Casadero, it says command center. So after the fires last September, this was also a command center and also a place where people could come and get cleaning supplies after things had calmed down. So we've been unable to get to the restaurant because of this, because of sometimes they closed it because of COVID. We had an ice storm in February and a few weeks ago they were shooting a movie here. So we've got a lot of history with just a bunch of, how should I say, uh, amateurs from a model train club trying to help out at a restaurant. Yeah, we're being compensated for all our expenses, but we're doing this out of the goodness of our heart because we just want this to be successful. And so here is Coastman, the gentleman there standing up with the shorts on, doing the clinic for his trees at the uh, convention in 2018. And there's Bill Decker, my goodness and a few other people we know here. And that was taken from my back porch, or excuse me, my front porch. All right. Thank you, John. Um, You're welcome. That undergrowth looks spectacular. I mean, I think that's what really sells that forest. Um, how are you guys doing that? Well, we're using, we're using some woodland scenics. We're using some of the JTT that uh, is those little, um, they're like woodland scenics, except they're by, um, I can't think of the company right now. They're JTT model yeah. rectifier owns them, I believe. I, yeah. Or model is, so or we're using pushing them. Yeah. We're using a lot of their stuff, but a lot of it's not available right now. It's hard to come by. But uh, um, I'm trying to convince Dan, well, I'm gonna twist his arm, that when we do meet, he needs to do a quick clinic because he's completely redone the Mount Hood Club several years ago. And uh, I don't wanna stop him from doing anything here. If he comes up with an idea, I either go, yeah, that's good, or go ahead. You know, he's, he's a master at doing this. I'm basically the uh, go for flunky, uh, you know, billing clerk and, uh, you know, whatever. I have a question, John. Uh, I noticed you mentioned in, the, in one of the pictures that the streets were all wooden. Uh, what? Not, I don't think all the streets, but we're going to make one street wooden based on that picture in the restaurant. That, that's unusual because that's not. Most of the streets were just dirt and mud. Most of the well, they, yeah, we have pictures of that. But when we saw a picture of a wooden street, we're gonna we're gonna incorporate it. I mean, it's on the wall there. It you know, you got cowboys on it. The owner is a horse person. She wants cowboys, so we're gonna have cowboys and we're gonna have wood. That's really unique. I think that's interesting. That's yeah, interesting. I think in Estacada, if you have a dirt road, you have a mud road. Yeah. Well, we also discovered on some of the old pictures, they also had a Safeway store, basically <laughs> in a strip in a strip mall, or on a on a on a on the street, not a <clears throat> not a standalone. So, are you planning on uh, disguising the origins of the track a little more by uh, weathering it? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna paint it and then polish it. Yes. He's going to come in with a with an airbrush that's run with a a can, I guess, and and paint it, and then we'll. I think we're going to put something on top of it and then polish the rails. Yeah. So, the paper buildings, I mean, are they cardstock that is self-supporting, or is, are they pasted onto a core, or what? They are a, yeah, they are a cardstock. I mean, they're. They're fragile, so we basically glue uh, toothpicks on the corners and then glue them to the layout or just shove them in. Okay. And I, I should have found out what he's using, but <clears throat> whatever he's doing, the detail is phenomenal. It really is. 
Are they multi-layer paper or uh, just a single print? It seems like it's a single. Okay. Because, yeah, I've seen some multi-layer ones where you actually, like, have windows, paper windows, where the frames are a separate piece of paper that goes on top to give you a 3D effect. Right. I wonder well, if that was the case. Now, the, the, let me tell you one other quick story. So <clears throat> both Dan and I don't really have good carpentry skills. So we gave the owner, Sherry, what we thought would be the right size and also uh, the layout's 100 square feet. And <clears throat> when you come in the door, it's four feet wide and then it goes to five feet. Anyway, her dad built the bench work in Idaho and brought it over on top of his van or pickup and installed it for us in, from Idaho. And then she goes over there and brings us back boxes of hundreds of trees. And uh, we, <clears throat> we probably have another 50 more we're gonna plant. So we believe in reforestation. You may be one of the few layouts with enough trees. Well, there has been a couple times where Coastman has had to shut down production because he's done stuff for museums. Hmm. Anybody else have questions? There's All also right. gonna, there's also gonna be a mural in back that's that's been painted by one of the artists from the uh Art back. Uh, art back. We didn't get any pictures of that, though. Yeah, we're, I was trying to show you what we have done. There's there's a bunch of gaps, including a like a shelf in the front where we're going to have a dam and water. So, um, yeah, we can do a little follow up on this. So are they painting the mural as a mural or as a backdrop? It's being painted on canvas. It's uh, 30 feet long and we'll put a board and drape it over the top and attach it to the wall, just hanging. We've already stapled it up and, and took a and looked at it, but the wall is going to have the shingles taken off and become um, a sheetrock and painted probably a light gray, but we'll still hang it with a, with a, I guess a one by four on the back draped over. So it'll be a hanging mural rather than something fully attached. But is it going to be painted as a backdrop? I mean, uh, well, just continue the forest scene or will it, it, it be a it, different well, scene? Uh, it, yes, it, it mirrors some trees. And then if you're standing uh, in the center of the layout, Mount Hood will be on your left. So she's got Mount Hood in there and then she's mimicked forest all the way around on the sky. But mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I didn't want to show it because she's actually done some, uh, she's changed a few of the colors a couple times. <laughs> yep. Well, yeah, we're definitely gonna, in a few months, probably want an update. So yeah. Take, take lots of pictures. Yeah, I well in the beginning I didn't take it, the proper pictures because the planning was done with two sheets of paper on the floor and a sharpie. So you know. <laughs> All right. So Jeff, I think we need to have a board meeting out there. <laughs> uh, they can arrange a, a private area for a group to overlook the water there. Yes, they can. And Harriet and my wife can talk to the owner. Yeah. Well, she's very good at lip reading too. Oh, good. My wife needs the practice and she'll admit that. Well, uh, the only sign I know is when I'm going down the freeway and somebody's ticked off. So we'll just drop it at that. <laughs> what, what sign is this? <laughs> For the, those of you who weren't there last night when we tested this out. Um, the owner of the Casadero is deaf and therefore uses American Sign Language, which my wife has a degree in. And John's wife knows. 
All right. So unless we have some further questions, going, going. Mr. Bunza, show um, us what you're going to do with magnets. Do I have the screen, sir? Yes, I need to do that. Thank you. Okay, very good. Oh, and if anybody has any questions um, during the presentation, feel free to put them into chat and I'll go through that with them afterwards. Okay, uh, good morning to all. Um, we're gonna talk about modeling with magnets and I hope to surprise at least some of you with some new applications that you may not know about or have thought about. Uh, we'll see whether or not that's true. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through kind of how I got into this uh, uh, area of uh, modeling. Uh, and it had to do with new things that occurred. Uh, we're gonna talk about using uh, magnets for multiple unit power lines, real working ones, air brake lines, uncouplers, remotoring, holding down different kinds of structures, uh, use of magnetic sensors and use of uh, magnets and animation. And there may be some other things that come up along the way. Uh, you can see in the background on this screen, by the way, uh, uh, US dime and the size of the magnets that I'm using in question. Uh, the ones on the far left over here are one millimeter outside diameter. Uh, these are also one millimeter outside diameter, but you notice that they stack a little different. Uh, these are two millimeter, uh, and these are two millimeter outside diameter. The inner hole is uh, one millimeter inside diameter. And these are 2.5 millimeter uh, outside diameter, and they're a little bit longer. And these I actually use on the brake lines. We'll show them a little later. And what I usually started with and have for a long time, I've used these disc magnets of, uh, this is a three millimeter this magnet, but I use them of different uh, sizes and strengths. So let's start with uh, looking at how we can use these in different ways. And of course, uh, the disc magnet that I just talked about uh, is, is pretty small. It's only three millimeters across. I've actually used some that are 12 to 15 millimeters across in animation. I'll show you that towards the very end of the uh, uh, clinic. And uh, uh, by way of reminder, uh, magnets have uh, two poles, north and south, a de definitive orientation. And when they stack, they stack north, south, north, south, north, south. So, uh, and I hope that all of you uh, in your childhood had learned that very early on. The big change for me in using magnets uh, had to do with the discovery of very small magnets with holes in them. Now you think, well, ring magnets, uh, which is typically what they're called, have been around for a long time. What's different today is there's a class of magnet called a, uh, uh, what, what is it called? A rare earth magnet. It's made with different material than the ones we used potentially when you were uh, uh, quite younger. Um, uh, and they can be made in different shapes and size much more easily than the magnets of old. The fact that you can get them with holes in them in varying sizes and dimensions, that's the thing that allows you to use them in really interesting ways. And on the bottom there, you can see uh, the link to an article in my blog that uh, gives more detail in some of these things. But interestingly enough, this clinic is actually more extensive in its coverage of the applications. Uh, here again is that uh, set of magnets that I showed before. These are all available from supermagnetman.com, a wonderful place. You can get them in lots of 10, 50, and 100 for a couple of bucks. So you're not talking about a huge amount of money. Um, and the little tiny ones are in fact really tiny. And uh, you really have to be careful handling them if you've ever worked with surface mount devices, if you push on one side of the surface mount device, they can go flying off your bench. Well, the interesting thing about the little magnets is they disappear in a different way. 
when you wave uh, an exacto knife or a ruler or a scribe or something over it, uh, they will leap up onto the underside of the thing that you waved over and disappear on you. So you really have to pay attention to where you place them and how you manipulate them. But these are the kinds of things that, that we use and the, the relative sizes that I use as well. Uh, the first thing I wanna talk about is using these to make electrical connections. And this is the latest thing that I've gotten involved with. And it led to uh, several other complications in my life, meaning more rabbit holes as uh, Ross Ames liked to talk about me going down. And as I remind him, I'm from Brooklyn. We don't have rabbits, we have rats. So the, ra the rat holes that I go down. Um, but it started with trying to make a coupling that would carry the power. Now these magnets are nickel plated. And the reason they're nickel plated is if they're exposed to the elements, mostly moisture and elements in the air, they will disintegrate in a couple of years. So the nickel plating is real nickel, uh, actually preserves them and holds them in place. So all of the, the uh, magnets that I'm talking about today are all nickel plated. And by way of reminder, uh, you might remember that uh, things that are magnetically, uh, are, that are magnetic are things made out of iron and certain kinds of steels, cobalt and nickel. Nickel, in fact, is magnetic. So uh, these are covered in a, a nickel plate to hold them together and preserve them. But the interesting thing is that you can actually pass a current right through the magnet. And there are some really weird examples of motors where the, the, uh, the electricity in the motor driving the motor actually goes through the magnet. And once I realized that, you know, I, it gave rise to lots of bizarre notions. And one of the notions was, okay, making these power connections. Power connections that I needed were made because I was building a mobile uh, piece of electronics that I haven't written about yet. And that mobile piece of electronics, I kept swapping batteries inside a car and I got tired of that. So I decided I was gonna make a power car that coupled to it. And I really did not like using a, a typical kind of plug-in connector. So I came up with this idea, hey, I bet I can use a magnet to couple the two. And that led to this MU power lines. The magnets in question are the ones on the bottom. Those are two millimeters outside diameter, one millimeter inside diameter. I take a flex gauge wire uh, that's 30 gauge. It, it has a silicone uh, outer covering and it's actually, uh, uh, multi-conductor on the inside. I'm gonna see if you can actually see that. Now that's a 30 gauge wire hold up. If you can see my picture, you can see it in front of my face and it's incredibly flexible. Uh, and that, that's the, the great characteristics about it. So what I do is I took the wire, stripped it uh, about, since this is about two and a half millimeters long, I stripped it for about, oh, eight millimeters long and then folded the wire back and forth on top of itself to fit it inside the one millimeter inside, shoved it in and shoved it up to the point where the insulation stopped at the out, uh, outer back of the tube and then glued it with super glue. Now that uh, folding over of the wire filled up almost everything inside the magnet so what I did was I turned to the face of it and then I took a scribe or a, uh, a pin and I shoved it inside to make sure that uh, I got electrical contact on the inside of the, the tube. Uh, now you can actually buy electrically conductive epoxy but it's really expensive. For a very tiny amount, you have to pay like 13 bucks uh, and it, it doesn't keep. Uh, so what I wound up doing is getting some electrically conductive silver paint. Now, I actually started with uh, nickel uh, conductive paint, and that was a mess because nickel's conductive and it globbed all over the outside of the magnet. However, silver is not uh, uh, magnetically uh, attractive. So 
All I did was put a drop on the inside of that, and I wound up getting a very nice connection. Uh, there's one other thing that I want to mention here as well. There's a couple of properties of uh, rare earth magnets that you really need to pay attention to. One is the vast majority of the lower cost ones that are also the weakest ones, but uh, there are different grades of the uh, nickel, was it nickel iron boron uh, that make up the rare earth magnets that I use. Uh, and depending on the mixture, the strength of, the, of what they can uh, be magnetized to changes. These are what I think are called uh, N40 or N N42, but you can get different grades and each one can be uh, carry a different uh, strength of uh, uh, magnetism. There are also different ones made with different materials like samarium. They're also, with samarium magnet uh, this size, uh, it would probably be three to four times the strength of the, these little guys, but they're also significantly more expensive. So you can pay attention to the grade of the magnet and also the materials that make them up. The magnets in question that I'm using that have a nickel covering uh, have two other properties that you need to be aware of. One is they're brittle. If you take two really strong magnets, and I'm going to show you two strong ones a little later, and you let them snap together like kids like to do, uh, if they're strong enough, they will snap together so fast and so strong, they will chip or break or crack, uh, ruining the magnet. Uh, so you need to be a little bit careful, uh, especially if you start uh, thinking, well, I'm going to use stronger and stronger magnets. Very careful. The other thing is the uh, nickel iron boron magnets that I'm using, and even the ones that are slightly stronger in magnetic force, uh, have an odd property that at about 186 degrees Fahrenheit, if you warm them up to that temperature, they will lose their magnetism. They will degrade. So soldering the 30 gauge wires to the inside of the magnet is completely out of the question. Uh, I know that there is solder that will, that will melt at a lower temperature, but I just didn't want to chance it because warming magnets up is a good way to degrade their performance. And the little tiny ones I'm using are strong enough for the application, but they're not super strong. So those are a couple of interesting properties that you ought to realize. There's another way to deal with this though, and there's some techniques here that, that you might want to pay attention to if you're working with tubes and really small material. And that is that the other property of these ring magnets is that they're incredibly accurately built with, with precision. So when I said it's got a, two, a one millimeter inside dimension, it has literally a one millimeter inside dimension so that you can take a one millimeter tube, which you can get, and you can actually use it to connect to the magnet, to the nickel inside the magnet. And here's how you do it. You take the tube originally and put it under uh, a piece of tape. Now this is just a, a piece of blue uh, masking tape. And here's the one millimeter outside diameter tube, put it all the way through. And originally this wasn't here. And I just took a uh, uh, Dremel Moto tool with a, a friction cutter and just cut right through the tape in the tube. And the neat thing about that is nothing goes flying off your bench. It's all held in place. You get a clean cut, which is amazing. And the two pieces, including the original tube and the little tiny tube are still there. So here is this piece of tape cut over here and then rolled back up and there's the little tube that I cut. And it's barely bigger than the magnet, the ring magnet I'm gonna insert it into. So I take that out, I put it under a separate piece over here, and then I take my wire and I stick it in and I solder the end of it. Here's the end solder, here's the brass tube here, and that's how you make the connection to the tube. And some of the solder will flow inside, and then uh, the, uh, the, the wire that I stripped was longer than the tube. I just cut it off at the end over here. Now, the one last thing that I do to form the connector, the magnetic connector, is I swage 
the brass uh, uh, the tube inside to make sure it holds in place after I've actually super glued uh, the solder connection at the back. I want it to be as strong as possible. So I take a tiny little drop of thick super glue, put it over the connection that goes to the, um, from the solder to the insulation in the back, seal that up and then cut off the front. And then what I wanna do is I wanna swage this. And for those of you who don't do much metal working, swaging in this particular case means opening up that little uh, mouth of the brass tube just slightly to make it larger than the outer uh, dimension of the tube. And you can do that with a number of different things. Um, I do it with a scribe. You can do, use a, a, a nail, you can use a center punch. And if you wanna get really fancy, this actually is a swaging tool that's used for rivets for eyeglasses. And it only cost me three bucks. And you can see that one side is a point and the other side will, is just a, a detented flat. And that actually will do the job too. So however you wanna do it, it's just another layer of protection to hold the connection in place. And here you can see the finished connection uh, with the wire connected to it. Here's what it looks like when you, when you wanna connect the two. Uh, what I've done here is I made sure that I had connections that had uh, different poles on the end of the connection. And the reason for that is on my, I want these to connect to a power car. And the power car has a battery in place. I'm gonna show you a picture of that in a second. And here's how the connections come out from the bottom of this power car, which is a box car down here. And on the bottom, you can see the two connections here. And uh, this has an electronic assembly with a battery holder, and it will put out five volts to these two connectors here. Now, since I wanna make sure I don't uh, insert the, the lines backwards, these are north and south and they're different. And the appropriate connectors that go to them would be south going to north and north going to south over here. And that's how, you, you slip them in to make the power connection. Now, when I built the car, I realized that uh, if I just had those hanging out with the sides exposed, uh, they might short together when the power was on. So what I did was, instead of doing that, I mounted them inside a sleeve. And I think the next slide shows the sleeve, yeah. Here's the sleeve on the bottom of the car. It's just a piece of, of plastic tubing. So when the connection, uh, this is a little caboose over here. When the connection from the caboose uh, uh, connects with it, it actually connects inside the tube about here and there's nothing exposed to the outside ever. And that's how the connection is made. The other thing you can notice is two things. Uh, there's another tube over here that just holds the wire in place and it's just glued to the uh, plastic bottom of this little caboose. Uh, and the length is chosen such that's when it's connected, there's a little bow here. And what's the little bow for? When you go around tight curves, that, sl that slack is taken up. It bows more on one side than the other, and this goes almost straight. And that makes sure that this doesn't pull out. So the magnet is there just to hold it in place. It's not to pull the car or anything like that. Okay? And... Uh, the way this works, I got to go back up. Uh, here's the battery. Now this is a, uh, uh, what is it? One, uh, one, eight, six, five, oh, battery. It's a lithium poly battery and it has all of the charging and limiting conditions actually on this little board and two DC, DC to DC converters to put out five volts on one side and 3.3 volts on the other. And that's what I wanted for a different project that provoked all this. The, the caboose lighting was just an example. The way it works is pretty simple. If you uh, push this switch over here, just uh, momentarily, it turns the power on. If once it's on, you push it again, 
and hold it in for a second, it turns the power off. So that switch was in the wrong place. So all I did was jumper it to a small, very sensitive micro switch that I glued in place over here. You can see it down here. And that actually sticks out in the door over here, which I just leave ajar or I slide open when I want to turn it on and off. And that little shiny thing down there is the micro switch. And you take a pencil or a toothpick or something sharp and small and you knock against it and it turns the light in the caboose on and off. Now, again, uh, this was for a much more complex project that I haven't written about or disclosed yet, but this caboose is an example of that. So you literally have power from a power car being used to power some other device or another car, which in this case is just a simple lighting thing. But you could actually use this to run power from car to car. The other thing that should be obvious is uh, you can actually have multiple uh, connections, not just two, going from car to car. Uh, uh, if you wanted to run more than just power, maybe a signal line or you know, you dropped an Arduino in and it's doing some weird thing like some of mine sometimes do. So that's, that's how you use it for a power connection. And it turns out that those magnets do the job, but they're actually pretty weak magnets. If you wanted stronger magnets, you could get them. You could make it a longer tube that would give it more uh, magnetic uh, force. You could also uh, go to a different grade of, of material uh, and get a stronger magnet. So you can go and play with that. Um, these wires that are here um, can be gotten from um, uh, amazon.com and you, you get them in uh, uh, seven spools of different colors. And uh, they're actually uh, great to use when I want a jumper from a, uh, a swinging truck that picks up power from the rails into a car. This is the kind of wire that I use. Very flexible. Uh, you could easily, if it's less than four inches, you could easily put uh, more than an amp through it without much of a drop. Uh, great to use. When you strip them and you solder to them, the uh, insulating material does not creep away from the heat. So they're, they're just great to use. Uh, okay, so that was the, the thing that kind of got me going with these new tiny magnets. And uh, I don't know if you've uh, read any of the, uh, the blogs or, or posts on Model Railroad Hobbyist Forum, or you might have seen the magnetic air brake lines that were shown uh, as a product. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about how they were made. And there was an original one that used a single magnetic disc uh, to make the coupling. And then there was a second generation one that used a small tube and the tubes went end to end. And I kept looking at it and trying to wonder how did they get to do that? Remember the air brake line is only one, one, one wire uh, or one line connecting from car to car. And I, uh, there's a lot of discussion about, well, how do you make that happen? Since if you have a North pole on one side and a South pole on the other, if you rotate the car, it doesn't match anymore. So going from the air brake lines, uh, going to the air brake lines uh, was a mystery to me. I don't like mysteries, I like to solve them. So uh, in investigating these small magnets uh, to do my uh, multiple unit power connections, I came across a different magnet and it's this kind of magnet. And the difference between these and these, if you look closely, uh, if you took a, a bunch of the magnets and kind of dropped them in a, in a dish and rolled them around, they naturally will couple together. And the ones that I just showed you will couple together like this up top. Where's my thing? Like this. These magnets down here that are used for the air brake lines couple together like this. They couple side to side. Well, why? Well, because they're not magnetized the same. These up here are magnetized axially. So the north-south pole follows the axis of the, of the cylinder. These are magnetized across the diameter. And these are called diametric magnetization. And these are the magnets that are used for the second generation airlines. 
So I'll show you how to go and make your own air brakes, air, airlines. Now, uh, truth be known, I have no particular interest in it. The only interest I had was solving how they did it. So I'm going to show you how they did it, and you can go and make your own airlines. Uh, so once you realize that you can get these magnets that are diametrically magnetized, and that if you just lump them together, they nominally connect north, south, north, south, north, south. What you do is you take a little toothpick and you glue it to one of these that are already in place and you mark it so that the top is clearly marked after gluing to show the top of the magnet. Now, what I originally did was I took a, a black magic marker and marked them all black on the top. And eventually my clumsy fingers rubbed it all off. So I had to come up with a different way to do it. And, and the toothpick, being marked with the, the glue joint was the right way. Now, realize over here that if you take the toothpick and if it's side by side like this, if I take that toothpick and see how it's marked, okay? And then I rotate it and I make it connect to the end of one of those uh, uh, in a row up here, then I have north south connection here. And if it's south north down here it will connect on the end now why is that significant it's significant because if i created uh those air brake uh lines on the end of each car so that each one of them was mounted on the end of the car north to the right south to the other if i flip them around they're oriented correctly to connect to the next car all the time. So the real issue is, how do you do that? How do you guarantee that they're all oriented the same way? And the key, again, goes back to the, the standard, quote unquote, magnetic connection that you have with a toothpick. But the key is, you've got to get the connections right on every car. Well, it turned out that the guys who made the commercial products figured that out. And this is what they did. It's called a MagnaLock. And what they did was they created a little template. And if you look closely in the template, one of their little magnets for the air brake is epoxied to the template in the right orientation. So that in effect, it's got north, south here. And what they tell you to do is take the hose that has its magnet connected to it and just let it ride and connect to the template. And they provide a little plastic piece glued to the template that just puts it at the right angle with an HO car to, to super glue to the car. So it's oriented correctly as you it is hold, held in place to super glue the brake line to the car. So you're guaranteed the correct orientation and the connection every single time as long as you use the, the template. Or you can use the Jeff Bunza standard template and you do exactly the same thing, but this is really clever because it actually holds it in place for you to super glue to the end of your car. And that's how it works. So the entire trick to it is picking the right magnet and then using the template that has the right orientation. Because notice if you, rotated this 90 degrees, it doesn't work. You have to have side to side symmetry so that when you rotate the car, you still get north south in the same orientation at each end of the car. And that's how it works. So you can actually go instead of paying 30 bucks for six or whatever they charge, you can go and make them for a lot cheaper if you want. The thing you'll have to experiment with is to pick the right tubing which could be a wire, it could be a piece of plastic, but it's gotta be really flexible because after you uh, glue it, you pull the template away, this has gotta hang down in exactly the right orientation uh, with uh, some uh, pull over towards the center, center because when you couple the cars, you want the two magnets to jump to one another. And in fact, they do. So it's really clever uh, from my understanding, it was first discovered by uh, 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 a Canadian modeler, uh, and uh, then he sold the rights 
to uh, what is it, PRCS or whatever it is, uh, that are now sourcing the Magnalock uh, air brake lines. But that's how they work. So having solved that, uh, I want to give you a couple of other examples of things that I've used. Uh, one is on couplers. The KD uncoupler uh, coupling magnet is great, but you got to dig out, you know, uh, underneath the, uh, the layout, uh, underneath the track. But you can solve it by using three by three cubes, and this is, was written up in two places on the, uh, the MRH uh, forum, and, and uh, there may have been an article too. I don't remember, but I remember there was a blog about it. So what they did was pretty simple. It was upgraded uh, with a suggestion from uh, Pierre 52 in New Zealand. Uh, you take the three by three by three cube magnets, put them all in the same orientation. And what he did was instead of gluing them together, he actually not only glued them together, but he took a piece of very thin styrene, glued them on the styrene, and then he could lay them in the track any way he wanted. And you can actually substitute these for a tie and they look pretty similar uh, once painted or you can put them in between ties. The key to get, getting it to work, by the way, is to have them all in the same uh, orient polar orientation. And they work great as an uncoupler that you can put anywhere you want. I've also tried this with, um, uh, what is it? Three millimeter discs that you can super glue in place between the ties uh, such that the discs you put on one side of the track are all south facing up. And I think I used one or two and then one or two on the other side of the track with north facing up. So again, you have different poles on either side of the track to pull the uh, uncoupling pins in different directions. But that's a, a really easy thing to do if you're, if you're gonna use magnetic uncouplers. This, uh, it's been written up a million places, but there's a couple of things that you ought to uh, know about this. Um, in the older motors, uh, this magnet here down at the bottom is made out of a material called Alenco, aluminum, um, aluminum nickel cobalt. And these were permanent magnets uh, that were used uh, in uh, DC motors, in the older DC, open frame DC motors. And what a lot of people don't realize is that over time, if the motor heats up, that heat from the motor will make the magnet weaker. Also, if you take the motor apart, these have a different property that once you break the magnetic uh, uh, circuit in effect, uh, the field goes north, south, goes around through the steel bar uh, over the armature and down here. And it, it actually gets modeled, uh, the, the field gets modeled like it was an electric circuit. When you break that, uh, usually there's a screw that holds it all together and you pull that magnet out, it turns out that significantly weakens the magnet if you take the motor apart to clean it. So 30 year old Alnico open frame motors uh, with Alnico magnets actually weaken over time. And you can take that out, disassemble the motor, usually with a screw somewhere over here uh, sometimes actually through the magnet. Uh, and if you take it apart, you can actually throw away that Alnico magnet and substitute it with a stack of uh, uh, neodymium magnets, rare earth magnets, uh, as long as you get the poles right. And in this particular case, the poles need to be going through uh, the, uh, the face of the magnet here. You don't want the poles going side to side. You want them to go the same way that the Alnico magnet was going. If you reverse them, when you power it up, it'll simply go in the opposite direction. So all you do is take it apart, reverse the magnets and put them back in again. Again, using with magnets this size for neodymium magnets, you need to be careful because they're a lot more powerful. If you snap them together, they can crack. If you snap them together, they can chip. Uh, and that's not a good thing. But if you're gentle with them, you can handle them. The other thing about using them that you should know is that if you want to separate them, the way you separate them is not by pulling them apart. It's by sliding them apart. Uh, let's see if I can show you this. Here's the uh, two magnets that I'm going to show you a little bit later. And when I 
just store them. You can see I've got about oh, eight, eight to 10 sheets of paper. These are sticky notes uh, in between them. And the reason for that is that the distance weakens the field. And because of that, I can actually move them much easier. If I took them apart, uh, slid them off the paper and let them go uh, snap next to one another, it'd be a lot more difficult for me to take them apart. So that's a, one of the things you need to learn and keep in the back of your mind. Now in replacing these magnets, you can, you can have a stack of them and you wanna get magnets that are approximately the same size and stack them up. Now in the example from the MRH forum, uh, this person actually used much smaller magnets and he not only stacked them vertically, he stacked them horizontally. As long as you get the poles to go in this direction, you're fine. Uh, these magnets stacked like this with, that are a little bit bigger will most likely give you a stronger field than magnet stacked like this. The one last thing to know is that if you look really closely at uh, the way this is mounted here, uh, this is just a shape to hold the, the top bar and the bottom seal bar in place to form the field around the armature. Uh, this is a little bit off in terms of distance. This stack of magnets is actually slightly higher than the original Alnico magnet. You can get away with that. What you can't get away with and what's tougher is if it, this stack was slightly lower than the Alnico magnet because it might not make the entire stack and you might have a little tiny gap there. You don't want that. But there's a really easy way to get around the gap. You don't put plastic or anything in there. You take steel or shim stock steel and you put it in in place. And that will make it every bit as strong as the original. In fact, these, the field from these uh, neodymium magnets are probably going to be on the order of four to eight times as strong as the original Alnico magnet. And that's a great thing to have because uh, it makes the motor more sensitive, meaning it'll start turning at a lower current and it'll run a little bit cooler because the, the strength of this magnetic field around the armature is much stronger. But what you want to do is get that stack as close to the distance of the original Alnico magnet. And if it's a little tiny bit short, just fill it in with a piece of steel or something that's magnetically conductive. Seal it up, tighten it up, and you're good to go. So you want this piece of steel to the, the magnet basically to be closed. And you get the best possible field around the uh, armature core. Okay, it's a, it's a really easy fix. And a lot of people don't realize that if they've got these really old motors, that magnet probably is not nowhere near as strong as it was originally. And it's due to heat and the possible disassembly over time that some modeler may have done. Okay, next thing we're gonna talk about is using magnets to hold down structures. And there's a really easy way to do it. And that is to put a magnet on the bottom of a structure or, the, or, or below, and to use a piece of steel or, or cobalt or nickel uh, on the other end. And you can actually just take it, drop the, the structure like a building or a figure or a signal and just mount it on top of that steel shim stock. Now there's no alignment issue and that'll stick anywhere on the steel. So that's an, a nice thing to know about. It'll hold it in place depending on the strength of the magnet and the size of the piece of steel. Uh, I use this in buildings to mount roofs when I've got a complex animation or mechanical assembly inside the building. So here you see a, a small building with four uh, three millimeter disc magnets mounted in the top. And in the roof itself, I just have, uh, I think it's uh, 0.005 pieces of steel shim stock. And I can show you what, how that looks and where it comes from. Here's the box. Here's the box it comes in. And 
I actually got this at the local hardware store once upon a time. And you might be able to see just how thin it is. And it's actually thinner than some uh, aluminum foil, but it's much stronger and it's magnetic. Uh, so you can glue that in a flat piece. You can cut it with almost anything. I usually cut it with scissors. And then I just glue it to the top of the roof. And what's not really shown here is that uh, I usually use a piece of uh, a roof, roofing material or wood that makes the alignment. And all the magnets are doing is just holding it down. Uh, but it's a really easy way to, to mount the roofs on so that you can remove them. So the, the hold downs, uh, I originally started using them to hold down uh, equipment on flat cars, loads on flat cars. And a lot of my cars are the old Athern Blue Box uh, models. And those of you who don't know on the flat cars, there's a piece of steel that runs the entire length of the deck that's right underneath the deck. So if you take a neodymium magnet and put it on the uh, under uh, part of the uh, load, like maybe behind a tire or, you know, if it's a box uh, in, inside the box, uh, it'll actually stick to the top of it. And if you've got braces to hold it in place from rolling around, uh, it's not going to move off that car. So it's a great way to, to mount the load onto a car that's removable. Uh, likewise, if you've got want a gondola load or a load for a hopper, uh, you can use a magnet to hold it in place as well. Again, I mentioned before that one of the big changes for me was finding magnets that are now uh, uh, shaped in all different kinds of useful ways. And now you can get magnets that are actually countersunk. And I use two different kinds. One is uh, countersunk for a 256 screw, and the other is countersunk for a 440. And the sizes are radically different. And I'll sh show you in, in, a, in a minute what they look like. Uh, I use one in case uh, with a screw uh, to mount the structure. And usually there's, there's some uh, thing that I'm screwing into the structure. Sometimes it's even a wood screw that's screwed into a piece of wood and just a steel flat for the base of, of any kind. It could be a steel uh, weight, it could be a steel shim stock. Uh, but the neat thing is that having it counter stuck means I can tightly mount the magnet uh, to the structure and it'll hold firm. Uh, I can also, instead of using just a steel base on the bottom, I can go magnet to magnet. And that's important because I can get a much stronger bond even with a small magnet. Note though, that I need to buy them in different pairs where the countersunk part, one of them is north and the other countersunk is, is south. Now that's great because it turns out that you can buy them in matched pairs. Uh, and uh, I can't remember if they're 50 cents a pair or something like that. Uh, I'd have to go look it up again. But it's great because that gives you a much stronger bond. Now, imagine if you've got, say, two of these at different corners of the structure, you not only get the strength of the hold down, but you can actually use them for alignment. And let's take another look at that. Uh, I can develop the alignment even better uh, uh, by manipulating where the magnets go. Now, suppose that I have two really strong magnets and I've got a very delicate structure, like, as I say, uh, I've got an outhouse, right? But I want it magnetically held down, but the magnets are too strong. If I try to lift it off, I might damage the structure. Well, remember the key thing that I think I mentioned once before is that if you increase the gap between the two magnets, it weakens the, the field, weakens the bond. So in building the structure in the base, simply countersink or move the ends of the magnets further away and you'll weaken the bond. So if I wanna change the strength of the, the hold down, I can do that by simply making the two magnets appear further apart from one another. I can do that in part if I filled in that space on the bottom over here with a piece of plastic or I use two layers for the structure uh, and I, I simply move the magnet uh, away I can fill that in with a non-magnetic non material like plastic or just leave a gap. Either way, it'll work. 
So I can control the strength of the hold down by increasing the gap. Um, the next thing is uh, something that, that came up with, um, oh God, I'm trying to remember the gentleman's name. One of the guys uh, that, that is posting uh, his uh, layout build on the MRH forum, he wanted to make a, a magnetic connection, but he also needed to make an electrical connection. That's really easy, particularly with using this technique, because I can simply take the exact same arrangement I had with a 256 screw, wrap a wire around it, and then tighten it down. And remember, the outside of the magnet of this is all nickel plated. Nickel is a great conductor. Then, as long as I make sure that these two magnets actually touch, I'll get the connection here. So I can put different numbers of connections on the bottom of the structures and actually wire through the magnet. And so all I have to do is lift the structure off, lift it back down, I've got all my connections made uh, and it works like a champ. Um, the other thing you can do, if I really want tight alignment, and I just don't want to depend on the alignment of the magnets themselves, then I can make one of these have a detent. I can insert it slightly and make the other magnet poke out from either the base or the structure so that in effect, they fit, fit like an index. And if I have one at each corner of the structure, then that'll provide the alignment precisely uh, to put the structure in place. And I'll still get the benefit of the magnetic hold down and also the electrical connection through the magnet. So those are all the different kinds of ways that you can hold down a structure, roofs, signs, uh, and magnetic hold downs, particularly for long sign posts uh, that stick up, that if you're clumsy like me and you're working over the layout, you can hit the post. And if it's tightly affixed in the base, you'll not, e not only knock over the post, you'll snap it. And it requires a major repair. If you have the hold down magnetically held down, it'll just tip over, especially if it's a weak hold down. Uh, and then all you do is take it, replace it, put it back in place and you're, you're operational again. Magnetic sensors I've used you know, pretty extensively. Uh, the earliest one I used was when I was building a crane and I took th this crane that was been made by about eight different manufacturers over a period of 40 years, together with little, uh, a drive that I modified from a micro RC tank. I ripped everything out of the tank, replaced the motors, uh, put the treads back on and wound up uh, uh, driving it with a, uh, a little tiny Arduino two different ways. And in this particular one, I wound up using a magnetic sensor and uh, a very tiny uh, disc magnet here that was simply mounted in a piece of uh, plastic with a pivot point. So this can go back and forth over here together with a sensor that actually looks like this that was mounted actually underneath here. And that shows in the next picture. Here are the, those two little magnetic sensors. A piece of plastic covers this over eventually. And you see the, the magnet on the end of the pivot. And as it moves over each sensor, the sensor picks it up and switches on. The Arduino senses it, and I'll show you what it's going to do. So once it's mounted on the bottom here, uh, you see the little pivot point, And eventually, that gets painted black so you don't notice it. And you see the sensors mounted inside. You can't see them from the outside once it's covered up. And that little magnetic shoe is actually used to be guided by an embedded uh, uh, metal. In this case, it's literally iron. But it, usually, it's a steel wire that's uh, ferromagnetic. And as the crane moves around, the drive just drives it forward until that pivot point moves from side to side. And when it moves too far to one side, the little, micro, the little uh, Arduino inside simply stops uh, one going forward, one track going forward, reverses it, and makes the other track go forward. So it literally pivots in place uh, using the two tracks. And so you wind up driving the crane around 
uh, a track that's based on the wire in here. Now the fall or car system that some of you might be familiar with also has an embedded wire, but it uses a mechanical assembly with a magnet uh, to follow the wire. And that mechanical assembly actually pivots two wheels in the front of an automobile or truck. And that's how that works. This actually uses the magnetic sensors to steer the tracks on the crane. And here's the finished crane. Uh, and that becomes a wire guided crane. For those of you who have grandkids or uh, children uh, that may have been a robotics club, a robotics class, uh, wire guided uh, tracks like this is one of the uh, simplest and easiest robotics uh, uh, projects that they usually uh, introduce kids to uh, when they're uh, learning robotics. In a similar way, you can take the very similar drive system and use it to control, remote control a crane using a different kind of Arduino called a Motino. And it's, it's like a, uh, an Arduino Pro Mini, but it has a little radio uh, transmitter receiver that's actually mounted on the same board. This was written up in uh, uh, an article that I'll re refer to at the end. Uh, the reason I'm showing you this is that this introduces another use of magnets uh, that starts by putting a one by one by one millimeter magnet in, embedded in the end of a hook. And this hook uh, is actually the hook from uh, an old Athern uh, 250 ton uh, uh, derrick uh, that I applied to uh, another one of these small cranes. So the magnets over here, and this crane is remote controllable. Here's, you can see it up close and personal uh, insert of the magnet. Uh, you, you basically drill a small hole, insert the magnet, epoxy it in and then paint over it. Once you paint over it, you can't, you can't even notice that it's there. And it's used to pick up a box. And the whole issue with magnets and this is you can pick up a box if you put, insert a little piece of steel in the top of the box. The issue is how do you drop the box? And I didn't want to simply drop the box. I wanted to drop the box and I wanted to pick it up again and move it as many times as I wanted to. And this again is another article that was written up and uh, the so-called magic boxes composed of relatively simple device inside. It's got a piece of steel that's mounted to what uh, ostensibly is a cutoff nail. And on the top of it, it's got a smaller piece of steel. And there's a little spring magnet that's a G-scale KD coupler magnet uh, spring that is used to hold this up. And what happens is you insert this inside the box like here, and notice that the spring will keep it up to the top so that when you drop the, the hook on top of the box, it connects with the little piece of steel on, on the top. And the big question that I originally posed as a mystery question is how do you get it to drop since it's just connected there? And the, the, the most common response was, well, you get a bigger magnet to pull it down when you drop it on a, 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 you know, a, a flat somewhere. And the problem with that is that if you have a bigger magnet to hold it down, then when you go to pull the top magnet away, uh, this gets tighter and tighter and tighter until there's enough force to pull it away. And this goes kind of boing, like a cartoon crane uh, or a trebuchet and launches the, the hook up and it's completely unrealistic. So what you do is you create a deck like this and you've got your magic boxes loaded on the deck. And inside that deck, you have a whole series of other magnets. And these magnets are, uh, let's see, I think they're one millimeter by about 15 millimeter uh, disc magnets. And you'll notice that they're, they're glued in place, super glued in place, and they're alternating north, south, north, south, north, south. Well, there's a reason for that. If you don't alternate them, and they're all north facing up, and you try to drop that in the middle of it, uh, the field is such that it doesn't grab hold of the bottom. Uh, and I could go through and outline the field for you, but that, that's bad conversation at this point. 
So the way you make it work is you alternate the magnets so that it'll grab the bottom of, of the, 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 uh, the box. And you, with the magnets raised to the top of the deck, it'll hold it down. If you, uh, and when I say hold it down, remember what it does. Uh, I gotta go back. What it does is it's gonna pull this bottom down, which means that it creates a gap at the top of the box. And that gap severely weakens the bond to the hook, which means you could just lift the hook up with, with no interaction. So by leaving it raised, uh, when you lower the, the box down onto the deck, you have the, the uh, magnets down. So you lower it to the deck, you bring the, the uh, inside magnets up, it then pulls the, the piston uh, down, releases the hook, and then you could let the hook go. And if you want to pick the box up again, you simply lower the magnets on the inside of the deck down again. This is done with a servo. And there's nothing holding the box down again, which also means that this is released so that this is at the top of the box again. So if you bring the hook over to the top, it'll pick up the box again. So you literally can release the box, pick it up, Again, move it somewhere else, anywhere on the deck, and it works. And there's no jerking around of the box. So again, this is another use of magnets in the animation. Last, I want to show you uh, two things. Uh, this is a typical uh, drive that I demonstrate when I'm talking about animation with uh, motors. And this is a, a simple uh, drive where there's actually two magnets mounted on the bottom of this forklift. And the only difference is, and they're, again, they're the three millimeter disc magnets. One has north facing down, the other one has south facing down. And there's a screw drive on the bottom of this that shoves up to the top of the plastic base, two other magnets, one facing south up and the other facing north up. And you'll notice that they couple to hold this in place and when I activate the screw drive, this little uh, thing that looks like kind of an overgrown nut simply traverses the screw from one end to the other. And there's a little uh, tiny micro switch on both ends, you can see it here. When it hits the switch, it activates a relay and reverses the motor to go in the opposite direction. So this actually will automatically move the pickup from one end to the other back and forth. And if you place a box in the middle of it on a, on a uh, skid, it'll actually, there's a magnet mounted here. It'll actually pick up the uh, skid and move it to the end. And the idea was that uh, you can uh, leave the skid at the other end over here uh, and, and create the animation of this going back and forth. And it's all done with magnets and these wheels are turning because it's being dragged along the same route. Uh, and you might think about it, uh, uh, there's actually a way to, to deal with this without a screwdriver, where you uh, could uh, actually have this turn a, a corner, uh, but I don't wanna get into that. But speaking of turning corners, there is a commercial product that you may be aware of where they've got, uh, and the first thing I'd seen with it they have figures, this is an HO figure, by the way, on a bicycle. And this bicycle is on a, uh, a, a, a surface like this, except you see the bicycle moving along and the figure's legs are moving up and down, pumping the bicycle. And that's another uh, uh, magnetic drag uh, animation. And you see the two magnets over here that are on the bottom and they match to two magnets in this uh, uh, other mechanism that they created. And this is a wide mechanism. They embed the magnets in the mechanism to drag the bicycles. Uh, and that is propelled by a mo single motor with a gear drive and two traction tires that are literally pulling this inside plastic all along. And I don't know if you could see it clearly on your screen, but these are made of small segments that couple together. And those segments are pulled along inside this track. And that's a U-shaped channel 
that you can form and curve all around and make all kinds of patterns. And of course, uh, there's a limit to the uh, arc you can get, the minimal arc you can get uh, on a turn. But it works quite well. Uh, again, there's another way to do it that's a lot less expensive. And someday I'll write that up. Uh, but this is commercially available. It's a little spendy. The interesting thing to me is you can actually buy the figure and the, uh, the bicyclist um, independently. And I can't remember, there's somewhere between $13 and $20. Uh, and this is uh, European made, although I think I've seen a couple of people selling it in the US and it's called Magno Rail. And this is the Magno Rail here. And this is on the underside, like my screwdriver is up here. So you mount that on the underside, you cover it with plastic, you mount your, your cyclists, and they also have cars. And uh, there's actually one where they drag a boat around the lake uh, that they've got too. The neat thing about this and the way it works, in case you don't know, uh, the leg is in two pieces. There's a joint here at the knee. There's a joint over here at the side of the figure. Um, and there's a, a, a very small disc and it's a uh, clear plastic right here. Well, it turns out that that disc is, touches the surface over here. And as it's dragged around, that disc turns and it moves the two feet on either side up and down. It's a really clever uh, uh, design uh, and it does work. Uh, there's lots of videos on YouTube of it. Uh, lots of people have used it, but it's, it's quite a nice animation to see but you could actually use it for cars and other things as well. Um, so that's the end of, of this. Uh, you'll be able to get this downloaded from the second division website. Uh, and it has references to where to get the magnets and the wire. Uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, URL for my presentation, but I'm gonna send it to Jeff and he can put it on the second division website. Uh, and you can get the references to the other stuff that I referred to as well. So it's a wide ranging set of things. And what I hope you got most out of it was not so much how to build the models that I built, but how to use the magnets as tools in your own modeling to do some really creative things. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Bravo. Excellent. Thank you. Indeed. Jeff, these are always a treat. These are, these are fun. It's, 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 it's things that you don't normally think of. The applications are so, so, so broad. And some of them are, once, once you get into it, some of them are just really cool and, and, and for just fun to do. I mean, really fun to do. Okay, so we do have a few questions on the chat, um, most of them from Richard. The first one is, any issues running DCC through the magnets? Have you ever tried that? No, you shouldn't have any, any issue at all uh, running DCC through. It, it, and the reason is it, you're actually running through the wire, through the nickel. Uh, I mean, some, some current could go through the magnet, but it's, it's a non-issue. And, and the entire magnet is coated in nickel. Nickel is a really good conductor, so that shouldn't be an issue. So the field wouldn't uh, degrade the signal shape? No, I, I actually looked into that because that's one of the things <laughs> they thought of originally. And it turns out you, the, 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 uh, the field in the neodymium magnet, even in the little magnet, is so blasted strong. You'd need to put like 100 amps through it to have an effect. Because think <laughs> about it, you only have one line of current going through. It's like one loop through it. You have to put this enormous amount of current to, to, to have any disturbance in the force, literally disturbance <laughs> in the force. But I actually, I actually looked into that. I have a friend of mine that, that, that's pretty good at, at magnetic physics. So I bounced some ideas off of him. And he said, you can't be kidding me. No, <laughs> good question. I thought it was a good question. <laughs> Other questions? OK. Um Richard, you may need to expand on this one. While magnets for a given uncoupler matter for the polarity, does it matter if another uncoupler is oriented the same way? Uh, so if you've got 
uh, for one uncoupling patch that you've put into the uh, uh, onto your track, you obviously have to have all three or four sticks of them north to one side and south to the other. But down the line a mile doesn't matter. Does it matter? Doesn't no. okay. Didn't no. think so. The, re but... the reason is those little hoses are ferromagnetic. They're not mag. They're not magnets. Okay. So no, it doesn't matter. Okay. And, and, can, and if you think about it, you could have answered your own question, because if you if you take the two cars, leave them coupled and reverse them, they still uncouple. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK, and for the remotoring application, um, can you have too strong of a remoter magnet? Never saw that. Um, I suppose it's possible, but I've just never seen it uh, at, at all. Okay. Uh, David Holden sees an application for magnets for attaching passenger car roofs. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody had already done that because Athern is doing it for their cab roofs on their new Genesis 2 models. Yeah, so it also can... turned out, I think BLI tried that too. Yeah. It just, it seems it would be less destructive than trying to use screws to hold a roof on. Or friction. The, or, or those yeah. bloody plastic clips. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I all for that. And the neat thing is you, you get to control how strong it is by the size of the magnet you use. Now, the, the other thing you can do, you don't have to use um, uh, ring magnets. You can actually get a magnet that's a 16th of an inch thick, but it's about uh, three eighths of an inch long. So it, it looks like a little post. So you mm -hmm. could glue that in the corners. And uh, generally speaking, as the size of the magnet gets bigger, the strength of the field gets bigger. So you get to control all kinds of stuff. Uh, and generally speaking, you can buy the magnets in groups of 10 for you know, a few bucks. So uh, uh, I'll show you something. Here's the, here's that thing that I showed you before. I gotta make sure I get this in focus. So you can oh, see over God. here. Yeah, you can see over here, those little tiny magnets. I have no idea what I'm gonna use those for. But they're really cool, and they're like dirt cheap. So I got those. <laughs> and uh, here are here are two of those. Uh, hope you can see them. These are the uh, countersunk magnets, and here is one. No, oh, I know I'm going to mess this up. Here you can see one that has the the screw. I got to put it where you can see it. Mm -hmm. There's a screw through it, right? And it's countersunk. And it's got a little nut on the other, other side of it like that. Okay. So you take that guy. You can take him and put him next to the other one. And there's... Oops, Lift up. Here's the two together. Okay. Now, I can easily separate these two like that. Okay, now let me show you two others that I showed you before. Here are two, this is for the 440 screw. These were for the 256 screw. You notice they're a little different, a little bigger? Much larger. Much larger. Now I will tell you, there's a good reason why I started putting the pieces of paper in between the two. It is tough to move these guys. It is absolutely tough to move them. So I'm going to slide them off now. Ah. And now they're together. The only way to separate these two is to slide the two with a lot of strength. Ah. I can't do it. <laughs> it sounds like it might be the best choice is a magnet on one side and metal on the other. You know, but suppose that you've got G gauge something. Or suppose that you've got an, an, an O-gauge uh, uh, lift-out bridge that you know, is, is two feet long that's, or two, three feet long that's spanning the, uh, an aisle. You can use these things because that thing that you're connecting them to is strong, and you can grab it and lift the whole thing. Uh, but you can get, and these magnets, by the way, are less than a half an inch across. You're not talking about big magnets at all. And they're probably about a quarter of an inch wide. Uh, 
and they're countersunk for a 440 screw. So you get the general size of this thing. They're not large, but they're strong as hell. And yeah. that's why I said, when you increase the size of the magnet, you're gonna wind up dealing with a much stronger field, much stronger attraction. So you need to be conscious of that and you need to know how to deal with weakening the bond. And that's why I went through all that. And if you go and buy surplus magnets, because you know you can buy 50 of them for a dollar, uh, which I've done, um, but you have no idea how strong they are. You need to know how to deal with the fact that uh, I want a weaker bond. Okay, this is how you approach it. I want to embed it in a, in a model. I don't want to rip the model apart. So that's why I talk about tools and techniques to use these in your own modeling. Yeah, uh, Ken Patterson in one of his What's Neats a couple, three years ago, demonstrated how he's using magnets to both align and secure a lift out bridge on his layout. So they're strong enough to hold it against the bumps and also to align it but oh, to get, get it out of there. In fact, that was, that was another thing that occurred recently on the forum. Um, I was talking about how to make the connection, the electrical connection to the nut and the screw on the back of these things. Um, what was wanted was to use these to mount, uh, not to mount, to align a, um, a railroad barge to the dock. Mm -hmm. Well, using only two of these things, I mean, you'd get perfect alignment because they're so damn strong. And if you built the barge uh, solid enough, I mean, you could use pretty strong magnets to hold it in place. And even these would work. But in all honesty, what I found more and more is I'm trying to find weaker and weaker magnets uh, for models, not stronger and stronger ones. Um. For the electrical connections, for putting wires in there, would it be better to squeeze the wire between a couple of washers instead uh, of between the nut and the magnet itself? Yeah, it would. Uh, and But even if you have the washer there, you can tighten that nut so much that you'll crack the magnet. I mean, it, it is possible to crack these things. They are brittle. And they're not like steel. They're not, they're not as strong as steel. Okay, so, it, you, you got to realize the way these things are formed, they actually start with a, 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 an alloy that's a, a mixture of powders, of metal powders, and they, they uh, force them together under heat to form the, the, uh, the shape, then they uh, nickel plate it, and then they magnetize it under this very strong field. So, so it's centered. Yeah. So you got something that, that's built in all these weird shapes, and uh, this is the reason they, they are able to use and create all these shapes. Whereas in the Alnico magnets of years past, uh, they were made usually in a bar that they cut uh, and then magnetized. So it was a different, really different process. Okay, that leads to Richard's next question is, does the nickel plating ever flake off? Yes, and it flakes off if you heat it and it'll flake off if you chip it. Uh, and sometimes you can actually crack it and it's the plating that'll crack. And I've had magnets where uh, I cracked it. I well, actually, I chipped the corner of it. I knew I chipped the corner of it. I decided I was going to use it anyway and come back two years later. And, and the surface is disintegrating literally in, in powder. And, and it, it, it was, it was terrible to, to get rid of um, a lot of times now. If I have a magnet and I embed it in a model, I will literally cover it with uh, super glue. So the, the nickel plating is a very, very thin coating. Yes, it's, it is. Not, not like it's embedded in a two or three millimeter layer of metal. No, no way. No way. Not even close. You know, you could probably count the number of atoms thick it is. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like uh, a gold foil that they use for, uh, you know, uh, putting putting gold and embossing on stuff it's really thin it's, it's very very thin so yeah you can you can crack it you can chip it you can crack it so you can't even see the crack you come back a year later and you'll all of a sudden you see the crack because it's disintegrating at the crack so that, that's why to protect them i just take a very thin super glue they have a super thin 
uh, super glue. I'll take that, I'll, I'll put it on a piece of paper, blob it on a piece of paper, take a toothpick and then coat the whole magnet. And you can bear, if you do it right, it doesn't really add any dimension to it. I mean, it's very, very thin, but it holds everything in place. And if you scratch it or you bump it or you're clumsy like me and you drop a tool on it, it's not going to do any harm. But so I've learned to go and, and do that. Just like uh, when I uh, uh, solder very fine wires onto LEDs, I will literally dip the entire thing in uh, super glue, very thin super glue. It doesn't change anything at all. Right. And it protects everything, holds everything in place, insulates the connections so that you can you can use it anywhere. You can put it up inside a brass housing. It's not going to matter. Good idea. Um, OK, this one's from David. Could magnets be used to attach decoders or speakers to the inside of a locomotive? Sure. I don't know why you'd want to, but you could do it. I wonder about the speakers. It's the just speakers, the speakers, yeah, basically a magnet it. itself. Yeah, the, the speaker is going to change the magnetic field inside the speaker, and every speaker has got a magnetic field. So you'd have to be ultra careful how you did that. But you could attach a decoder. There's nothing particularly magnetic. Ah, I take it back. Some decoders have a reed switch hmm. actually mounted on the decoder. So you got to be real careful of that. Otherwise, you'll permanently be resetting the decoder, hmm. which is usually what the reed switches do. I was just thinking, and the ESU lock sounds since they're read writables it, because the prom, you have to do something special to a magnet's not going to affect that. Is I don't, it? It, it, most proms now, the answer would be no. Okay. So once upon a time, there was a ferromagnetic memory. Uh, it would have an effect on that, but nobody uses them anymore. Are there any other questions out there? Remember that you're probably on mute. All right, um, let me open this up. Does anybody have any presentations they'd like to do kind of an impromptu thing? Okay, not getting anything from that. Um, does anybody have any questions for anybody on anything? Let's open it up as social hour. Though I don't think it's gonna last an hour. <laughs> Just go ahead and unmute yourself and let's hear you. I'll, I'll add I'll add one thing that uh, only because uh, I have a personal beef with it. Uh, I use this guy. Uh, if you look at that, that's a, a battery holder for that that special battery. That's a two point two and a half amp hour battery. That means you could draw an amp from that battery for two and a half hours in, in theory and in, in practice, it's a little different. I think it's about the same size as my cell phone. Yeah. In fact, I wanted, you asked me about that the other day. I wanted to show you this. Ah, double A. Double A battery compared to that. So it's not the same. Not even and close. Two double A batteries uh, back to back or longer. And you can also tell that it's, well, I don't know if you can tell. Yeah, it's much bigger dimensionally. It's, it's a little thicker. The thing that I wanted to point out is if you guys ever, uh, either read uh, the article or uh, go follow up on this thing. Uh, I don't particularly like uh, this battery or this battery holder. Actually, I like the battery. I don't like the battery holder. It does a great job as far as it goes. But what I found out was every time I ordered it from Amazon, I got a different holder. Mm. Um, and some of them had a little slide switch over here instead of the push button. Uh, some of them did not work at all. I had two different orders, uh, fortunately for only two, um, that did not work. No matter what I, I did or, or invented or tried to find out instructions on the net, it just didn't work. Uh, I, I got one out of a set of three that wound up working, which was this one. And I went the other day, because I always like to check my URLs that I give to people. Uh, all of them are now different. So I didn't provide a URL for this thing, uh, but that thing, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen these uh, batteries uh, that you can reach, emergency batteries you can recharge through a USB connection and they'll charge your cell phone, you know, when you're Perfect. away. Right. 
Well, this is the equivalent inside of one of those. You recharge it by using these two connections, one of these two connections over here. You get a cable that goes from there to your uh, five volt uh, uh, USB connector and that charges the battery up. And it does a good job. You know, it seems like it does all the right things. And then once you, you've got the battery charged, you can use the USB connection uh, that you can see over there on the end, uh, or along the side on both sides, it's got connections for five volts and 3.3 volts, which is what I use. Um, so you can use it in all those different ways. The problem that I've got is that whatever who, whoever is manufacturing and selling these things keeps changing the design. And I know from the originals that I got, they changed the design because it didn't work. So basically, I don't trust it. And uh, consequently, I don't really uh, go around recommending it. But what you actually can do and what you might see, you can actually take uh, two AA batteries back to back and put them inside a car. So if you wanted three volts or six volts, if you stack them one on top of the other inside the, uh, the car, because here's the, uh, the outer covering for it. So you can get an idea of, of the size. You can actually make a, a, a six volt uh, power car just using AA batteries. And you can get these to be lithium batteries and, and they're, they're pretty good. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to, to cut it, but I actually don't recommend these particular battery holders and chargers, even though I did find one that works. I can't find the same one anymore. So I've got no way to recommend it. Uh, I hate to disappoint people, but that's the way it is. However, the magnetic connection still works. <laughs> um, have you got a, for the battery holders, they've got, triple a and double a battery holders out there oh, have yeah. you looked into any of those uh, i have them i haven't tried it because i didn't want to keep swapping batteries when i came across the uh, 18650 uh, battery i mean it's got so much power in it it's ridiculous and in the application that i actually wanted to use it for it wasn't the caboose uh, <laughs> it, it was for uh, an, another electronic set and uh, that was more than enough power that I didn't have to keep recharging it all the time. So, so that, that's, why the power. Up, that's why I wound up with it. All right. Any other questions from anybody? I have, I have one on the, back on batteries again. I've got some of these first magnets that I've used to mount removable roofs on structures. And you refer to them as north and south. And I understand how do you determine which is north and which is south? I like, understand you can take two south, try to put them together and they repel. You take two north together and they repel. And you put a north and a south together and they connect. So which one is north and which one is south on the side or does it make no difference? Oh, uh, you're gonna love the answer to this one. It, it doesn't matter as long as you, you, you identify one of them, Yeah. right? But, so remember my little toothpick with the magnet glued at the yeah. end? Well, for every kind of magnet I use, I have a stick with a magnet glued on the end of, of the stick and I mark it and that becomes my reference. So if I always want to know what's north and what's south, I simply take that stick with the little magnet on the end of it. And if it attracts, I know that the other magnet is the opposite pole. And that's all you need to know. Okay. Uh, I didn't, it didn't seem like it would make much difference other than, I noticed when, it, when, it, when you buy the magnet, there's no, no notification on whether it's north or south or east. Right. Or now the... The only time it's going to make a difference is when you re-magnet a motor. Because if you put the pole in backwards, when you put power to the track, it will could potentially go in the reverse direction because the magnet's mounted backwards. So if I put, uh, normally 
when you have an engine, if you put plus on the uh, engineer side of the locomotive and you put minus on the track on the fireman side of the locomotive, it'll go forward. So if you reassemble your motor with your new magnet stack in it and you have plus on the engineer side, minus on the fireman side, if it goes in reverse, you put the magnet in backwards. That's the only time that I know of that it matters. Well, I've, I've been where I've, I've, I thought I had it right, and I, and I glued them to the, one to the structure and one to the roof. And when I tried to put it on, it, re, it repelled, and obviously I must have turned the magnet over. Yep. So what I got to doing is I took a little red uh, Sharpie, and I marked one side and, and the, and the other side. So when I put the two colored sides together, they, I knew that they were correctly positioned. Yep. But, now you could, you could have had a tourist attraction on your layout, the mysterious levitating roof. Yeah. All you, all you need is one reference magnet. Yeah. So I, I usually take a small magnet glue it on the end of a stick. Uh, and that's my reference. Okay. So if it attracts to that, I know it, it's uh, the opposite pole. And yeah. if it repels, I know it's the same pole. Yeah. That's, all, that's all I need. And 99% of the time, that's it. Well, that answers my question. It really doesn't make any difference just as long as they repel and attract to the right, right. right, right position. So. Right. Okay, thanks. Okay, anybody else? Going once, going twice. It's by my clock about seven minutes till lunchtime. So I think I'm going to go off and have lunch and I invite you all to do the same. And we will see you back here next month. Thank you all. And thank you to Jeff and to John for your presentations. Thanks, Jeff. It was really good. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Hi, all. Yeah, thank you.